and I'm very happy to share uh, this tutorial with all of you. So the topics that I'm going to discuss today are motivated by this goal of understanding the molecular machinery that makes up life. Um, so proteins, uh, in this illustration shown here, this is a protein. Proteins are nature's molecular machines, and they're at the core of many of the most basic questions that we have about life, about how life works. Um, and in particular, we care about how proteins interact with each other and how they form three-dimensional structures. Um, how proteins fold, how that works, why proteins sometimes misfold. These are important questions with implications for disease research and pathology. Um, and then more uh, generally, we can ask questions about, or in other cases, we can ask questions about how some proteins like enzymes might bind to substrates. And we can ask questions about how drugs might target certain active sites on proteins. In all, of this case, in all these cases, we're talking about molecular machines undergoing uh, conformational changes, large-scale structural conformational changes. Um, and these processes can be extremely complicated. So this diagram here uh, is, uh, is generated from a calculation, a piece of software called Folding at Home, uh, which is a distributed computing project. Uh, you can download a piece of their software onto your personal computer and then it runs in the background when you're not using your computer and it carries out protein folding calculations. It's a pretty cool experiment. Um, and I don't really wanna go into the specifics of how of the details of this picture, except to show um, that calculations like this and experiments um, illustrate that uh, there are many different pathways that an unstructured chain of amino acids shown here on the left um, can take to go from their unstructured state to their final folded state. Um, and this pathway, you know, has a bunch of intermediate structures and it might look kind of complicated, but actually it's an oversimplification. It's a huge simplification because there are a huge number of conformational pathways that this uh, chain could take to go from an unfolded state to a folded state. And this picture is neglecting how different proteins might be interacting with each other and with the environment. <laughs> And protein environment interactions can be incredibly important. And determining which pathways that a protein takes uh, are real and which ones are important and which ones can lead to pathologies or could potentially be used as a drug target are very difficult to predict and are often very challenging to measure. Um, and getting even partial answers to these questions is a big challenge. And uh, the reason for that is that, or there's a few reasons. One of them is that there's a range of time scales involved um, from the microseconds, which is sort of the time scale of secondary structure formation in small proteins, uh, all the way up to seconds or longer uh, as larger structures assemble and contacts between proteins form. Um, and then also to really understand at a basic level what's going on, you want at least site-specific information about different parts of a, of a biomolecule. And really what you'd like is atomic level resolution about the, the structural changes that are going on. So luckily we have uh, at our disposal a large array of techniques, an ever-growing array of tools that we can bring to bear to answer, to answer these questions and study these systems. Um, and today I'll be giving an overview of just one of these tools, uh, which is solid state NMR, and in particular, time resolved solid state NMR experiments, um, which we can use, uh, hopefully, to extract structural information um, about the time evolution of these complicated biovisible processes. Um, so, the idea in a time resolved NMR experiment is to set up a well controlled experiment um, where you initiate some biophysical process using an external trigger. Um, proteins respond to their environment, so that trigger could be a change in the pH or a change in the temperature, or it could involve mixing two different components together, two proteins or enzyme and substrate. Uh, and then as the process evolves over time, um, what you can do is suddenly halt that process by freezing the system. Uh, and this stops any further evolution and takes a snapshot of the process if it's done quickly. 
Um, so you can capture the protein as it's folding or the enzyme as it's binding to a substrate. This is the idea. And then we take those snapshots, those slices of information, and we uh, pack that sample into an NMR rotor. And then we can conduct a whole different array of NMR experiments to try to reconstruct, to try to get structural information out of those individual snapshots. And then finally, we can take all of those individual snapshots and piece them together at the end to get an overall picture of the whole process. Um, solid state NMR is a great tool to use for this. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with solid state NMR, but um, many of its benefits include that it can provide atomic resolution. Um, and it's obviously residue specific and highly localized information. It can also be quantitative. Um, which is very important if we want to understand what the different populations uh, of various structures and structural intermediates in our process are. Um, also, NMR is uh, moderately tolerant to disorder, which is very important um, because rapidly frozen samples are highly disordered. Uh, certainly, they lack long range order. And even on the scale of individual molecules, uh, an unstructured ensemble of proteins, when it freezes, forms a completely disordered mess. Um, so you need a technique that's tolerant to disorder. And then finally, as I said on the last slide, there's a whole host of NMR tools that we can use to probe these systems. Um, so rapid freezing to halt reactions is an old idea. Uh, it goes back at least 60 years. Um, and there have been a variety of techniques developed to quench uh, biological systems or uh, in general chemical reactions uh, mid-reaction. So here's a schematic of an apparatus uh, described in this paper from 1961, uh, where two different solutions can be loaded into these syringes and then together rapidly mixed uh, in this mixing device here. And so these two different solutions could be two chemicals or they could be enzyme and substrate or uh, two different proteins uh, or any, any reaction you want to study. Um, the mixture flows through the mixer and then through this tube labeled K, uh, where the reaction actually takes place after the mixing has happened. Um, but the, the idea is that you make this length of tube K short enough that the time necessary for the reaction to happen hasn't passed fully by the time the solution leaves the tube. Um, and then you let it shoot out of a nozzle at the end of the tube and freeze the jet that comes out very quickly. Uh, and a great way to do that is to shoot this jet into a cold, immiscible liquid like isopentane, um, which has a very low uh, melting point and can very rapidly freeze whatever aqueous solution uh, you shoot into it. And then by changing the length of this tube K, you can probe different uh, time slices after the mixing. Uh, as it's carried out in this, in this mixer H. Um, so this technique uh, was applied right from the beginning to uh, study various enzyme catalyzed reactions with EPR spectroscopy, uh, as well as IR spectroscopy and a few other techniques. Um, but uh, NMR was a little bit late to the party. So it wasn't until the 90s that people started using rapid freeze quench techniques uh, together with solid state NMR to answer structural questions. Um, so the reason for that delay, there are many reasons for that delay, many techniques were developed, including the widespread adoption of magic angle spinning, techniques like cross polarization that really made NMR uh, be a sensitive enough technique um, that could provide the type of structural information that, that are interesting. So these are some of the first experiments to use time resolved NMR, I've outlined them here. Um, using a rapid mixing and then freezing device to study this enzyme catalyzed uh, reaction. This, this is the reaction of the enzyme EPSP synthase, um, which, is an, uh, which is important in the biosynthesis of uh, aromatic amino acids in plants and other microorganisms. Um, but this enzyme is not found in animals. And it, that makes it an attractive target for herbicides if you can block this enzyme. Um, so Evans and coworkers carried out these experiments 
And what they did is they introduced a carbon-13 label at a particular spot on, the sub, on one of the substrates of the enzyme. They rapidly mixed uh, enzyme and substrate one with substrate two, and then froze the, the product, the partially uh, catalyzed product in a liquid propane bath, which was cooled to 85 Kelvin. And then by varying uh, the time between the mixing and the freezing and tracking the carbon-13 signals as shown here on the right, um, they were able to find signatures of several different uh, intermediate states in this reaction process as a function of time. Um, so they were able to find signatures of the initial uh, labeled substrate here, this is the free substrate, as well as signatures of the free final product, which grow as a function of time, uh, and signatures of a bound final product, which was the final product still attached to the enzyme, um, which first grows and then stabilizes and decreases at the end. They also found signatures of an intermediate enzyme bound state, um, which initially grows peaks actually at the earliest time point uh, between 20 and 30 milliseconds and then decreases afterwards as a function of time. It was not seen uh, in this final time slice, which is uh, what happens if you mix these reactants, leave them sitting on the bench uh, for a few minutes and then freeze them quickly. Um, so this, this apparatus uh, could freeze uh, a solution in about two milliseconds. Um, which was much faster than the reaction they were studying, um, but is slower than many processes uh, that you might encounter in, in fast folding proteins. And a big challenge in this experiment was the sensitivity. Um, so they needed to use, this technique was really limited to proteins and enzymes that could produ be produced in large quantities uh, and could be handled relatively easily because of the large sample volumes and high concentrations needed. So. Any one of these experiments took many hours to acquire, um, and that's using uh, concentrations that were that were limited by the precipitation of their enzyme uh, in the experiment. Um, so more recent experiments uh, have explored how versatile this technique can be um, in, to capture early stages of, of freezing and to really capture uh, slices of time. Um, that are very, very narrow and well-defined. Um, so the, the freezing time uh, depends on the dynamics of the interface of the jet and the cold liquid. Um, so using a smaller, uh, faster jet can lead to a smaller, and can lead to a faster freezing time, uh, as shown in this work from about 10 years ago, uh, where a high velocity jet was shot out of a nozzle with just a 20 micron aperture. Um, looking at uh, the frozen particles that were that are extracted from this solution, so these are these are frozen particles dyed green. Uh, the average particle size could be estimated, and from that, the average cooling time could be estimated. And this fast freezing device could could freeze uh, a could freeze a, a, a liquid solution down below its freezing point in, in, on the order of 10 to 20 microseconds, or certainly less than 30 microseconds. Um, we can compare that time scale to much faster time scales that are accessible uh, using optical techniques. So uh, fast uh, laser temperature jump uh, techniques are techniques that can be used to study the folding and unfolding of rapidly folding and unfolding proteins. Uh, like this 35 residue uh, villain headpiece subdomain HP35, which is one of the fastest known proteins folding. Um, so the way experiments like this are carried out is that a solution of, of, of protein um, can be heated with a very short, very intense laser pulse, just 10 nanoseconds long. And this heating uh, can cause the protein to partially unfold. Um, so on the right here is, is shown uh, an experiment tracking the fluorescence of this tryptophan residue on HP35 after uh, excitation from a short, intense 
pulse of laser light heats the protein solution just enough that some of the protein starts to uh, starts to unfold and disassemble. And as you can see, the refolding takes place very quickly. It's on the microsecond time scale. And actually a lot of activity happens very quickly in this process. So the temperature jump that you can get with this technique is around 10 degrees. And these experiments are typically carried out right at the temperature where about half of the protein is folded and half of the protein is unfolded, right around the midpoint temperature. Um, and a little over 10 years ago, um, experiments using time-resolved NMR were carried out on the thermal folding and unfolding of HP35 in a, in a similar way, or with a similar goal in mind, but using quite a different technique. So in these experiments, uh, solution containing HP35 was heated uh, to about 90 degrees C, where HP35 is nearly completely unfolded. Um, and then after equilibrating at that temperature, it was rapidly frozen by ejecting it out of this, um, this hot chamber and into this cold isopentane bath. Uh, the solution was collected and packed into an NMR rotor. Um, and the early stages of uh, folding were, were, were probed using this technique. Um, so uh, the, 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 lab, the isotope, Labeling that was used in this experiment was very sparse um, for, for reasons that I'll explain more later, but essentially are related to the line widths um, that we see in these experiments. Uh, but this, uh, this on the right is a 2D, 2D, sorry, a 2D carbon carbon correlation experiment um, carried out on a slowly frozen sample, where slowly frozen means the liquid solution was pipetted into an NMR rotor, and then the NMR rotor was plunged into liquid nitrogen to freeze it. So cooling time was a few seconds. Um, and the, the final structure you get when you cool a solution slowly like this um, is some NMI, energy minimizing state, which is the fully folded state of the protein in this case. Um, and uh, this spectrum highlights two different labeled residues. Uh, in particular, this residue valine, this valine residue, valine 50. Um, which in its folded configuration adopts a particular conformation so that you see a splitting uh, in, the, in the C gamma uh, cross peaks, the C alpha C gamma cross peaks and the C beta the C gamma cross peaks. Um, so this, this particular configuration, this particular splitting is, is only seen in the fully folded state. Um, and that's been shown with uh, chemical in chemical denaturation experiments. Um, the same experiment carried out on this high temperature on this high temperature treated uh, solution shows that what's trapped in the in the frozen sample that's packed into an NMR rotor is something quite different. Um, so here, not only do we see that the valine cross peaks do not uh, display that same splitting, indicating that the the valine um, residue in this unfolded state is not adopting its its uh, native fold configuration. Um, we also see a significant amount of population um, that has an alpha carbon chemical shift consistent with what you'd expect from a random coil configuration, not from an alpha helix. So this is evidence that, that uh, despite the fact that HB35 folds very fast, this fast freezing technique was able to capture at least a partially unfolded state. Um, so further measurements with different labeling patterns told a similar story, and I'll just summarize the results briefly uh, of, of, of this study of Khan Hu's. But basically, um, the, the picture that emerged uh, was that this initially unfolded state at high temperature um, rapidly converts you know, on a, on a time scale that's similar to the freezing time around 10 or 20 microseconds to some intermediate state with a partially formed intermediate, partially formed secondary structure. There's large amount of alpha helical content, um, but not a fully formed tertiary structure. Uh, so it's not the same as the fully folded protein. And we know that by looking at the um, overall line broadening we observe and also the positions of the C gamma chemical shifts. Um, so conversion from this intermediate to the final fully folded state obviously takes much longer than the freezing time, 
um, but was not probed in this experiment. Um, so again, the main problem with these experiments or the main challenge with these experiments was the sensitivity. So HB35 is a, is a pretty forgiving protein, which can be made in large quantities. Um, and these, these experiments were performed with concentrations around six to eight millimolar. Um, and even so, single 2D carbon-carbon experiments took a number of days to acquire, um, which is, can be prohibitively slow if, if your goal um, is, is to really capture many snapshots of an evolving process rather than just, just one or two. Um, so a big challenge uh, to extending the usefulness um, uh, of time-resolved NMR is addressing the sensitivity issue, um, which comes mostly from the fact that NMR is an intrinsically insensitive protein. Um, and there are compounding problems. For example, the frozen solutions in the, in the frozen state, the NMR lines are typically broad, and there's also a large amount of conformational disorder, which means that the lines are even broader than they would be intrinsically. Um, and the measurements are performed at low temperatures where relaxation times are quite long. So it, to summarize the challenge, we have weak signals from a few spins and broad lines in a low temperature sample. And the solution, um, to address this problem is to use a technique called dynamic nuclear polarization, which can boost the, the, the sensitivity of NMR experiments and improve the amount of signal that we can, we can pull out of our experiments. So in the next section, uh, I'm going to talk about how uh, we use DNP to improve sensitivity and about how we are today carrying out time-resolved NMR in the TICO lab. Uh, but first, I would like to pause and see at this point if there are any questions um, uh, from what I've covered so far. Are there any questions? If not, I suppose I can continue. Um, and then if people have questions, I'll stop again uh, towards the end. And then, and then obviously at the end, we can, we can take a break for further questions. Um, so in the next section, uh, I will talk about the NMR and DMP hardware that we use to carry out the low temperature NMR experiments um, that we need to characterize the, 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 the frozen slices that we can um, the frozen time slices that we can acquire in, in, our, uh, in our experiments. And then I'll talk about techniques that we use to actually generate that time sequence, that series of slices, the, that, that series of snapshots um, in our experiment. Um, so most of you probably know about DNP, um, but for those of you that don't, this is a brief one slide summary. Um, so NMR is an is a intrinsically insensitive technique because the signal is proportional to the nuclear spin polarization, which is the difference in the number of spins that are aligned and anti-aligned with the external magnetic field. And since that difference is very small, just a small fraction of a percent, uh, the signal is very small. Uh, DNP takes advantage of the fact that electron spins have a much larger gyromagnetic ratio uh, than nuclear spins. Uh, the, the, Electron spin has a, has a gyromagnetic ratio around 660 times larger than that of a proton. Um, and that's at a given temperature. Therefore, at a given temperature, the electron spin polarization is much larger. So there are two main ingredients for DNP beyond uh, what is needed for a typical low temperature NMR experiment. And that is a source of unpaired electrons and a source of microwave magnetic fields to excite EPR transitions uh, in, on those electron spins. So cross-effect DNP, which is the mechanism that we use to perform most of our DNP experiments, uh, can be understood in terms of a three-spin system, two electron spins, and one nuclear spin. And basically, what we do is we use microwave radiation uh, together with spin-spin interactions to transfer polarization from electron spins to nuclear spins, uh, flipping nuclear spins from pointing in one direction to pointing in another direction 
And then elect, uh, nuclear spins have quite long relaxation times compared to electron spins. So we can do this process over and over and over again, uh, leading to a large, a lar much larger than thermal uh, difference in the number of spins that are pointed uh, in one direction versus the number of spins pointed in the other direction. And this leads to a correspondingly large NMR signal. Um, in the Tico lab, in the experiments that I'll be talking about here, we carry out low temperature uh, magic angle spinning BNP in a home built uh, NMR probe designed and constructed by Kent Thurber. Um, and this instrument carries out DNP at very low temperatures. Uh, we do DNP at 25 Kelvin um, using uh, nitrogen gas to spin these uh, extra long four millimeter rotors. So nitrogen gas for drive and bearing is, uh, is used to spin, this, to spin the rotor. And the center of the sample is cooled um, using cold helium gas. Which, which leads to a large temperature gradient developing across the rotor um, and leads to us getting very low temperatures right at the sample position. So an advantage of this technique uh, over using just helium gas to do as well as cooling also the drive and bearing uh, is that we save a lot of helium. So our helium consumption is relatively low compared to that compared to what it would be if we were also using helium gas to drive our spinning. Uh, we typically use around one and a half liters per hour if we're operating at 25 Kelvin. Um, and uh, we can get very nice, very stable spinning for, for uh, a long period of time using, using, uh, using this approach. Um, this is a layout of, basic layout of our NMR experiment. Uh, to generate microwaves, we use a 1.5 watt standard interaction oscillator, uh, which operates at 263 gigahertz for our 400, MR, 400 megahertz NMR spectrometer. So uh, one big advantage of working at 25 Kelvin uh, is that you don't need as high microwave power as you do at higher temperatures for DMP to operate. So actually at 25 Kelvin, 1.5 watts is plenty uh, for a cross-effect DMP using, using biradicals or triradicals. Um, we use a combination of microwave waveguides and quasi-optics to guide the microwaves from the EIO uh, to the sample by a waveguide in the probe. It starts at the bottom of the probe and carries up to the top, as shown in this diagram here. Um, and then we have a liquid helium doer near the magnet to provide helium gas to cool uh, our sample. And we have a commercial MAS controller, which, which drives the drive and bearing gas, which are both, again, using room temperature nitrogen. So a typical DNP experiment starts by first uh, pre-cooling the NMR coil and sample region using helium gas. Um, and then when you're ready, uh, and, and, and you have some, you have some uh, dummy sample uh, or some, some standard sample uh, loaded in the rotor, and then when you're ready, you slide the quasi-optics out of the way and lower the probe below the magnet. And then you can remove the dummy sample from inside the probe by opening a little window in the side of the probe. And then quickly uh, transferring your carefully frozen and prepared sample out of liquid nitrogen storage and into the probe. And that process just, just takes a couple of seconds. Um, and the sample does remain cold the entire time, which is very important because as soon as the sample warms up, we lose our carefully freeze-trapped uh, system. And then once the rotor is, is in the probe, we spin the rotor back up, uh, put the probe back in the magnet, um, and, and slide our quasi-optics, which are on rails, right back into position. Uh, and this whole process, this whole sample exchange process takes a few minutes, five minutes, seven minutes. Um, and this ability to rapidly change samples while keeping the samples cold uh, is, is, is really crucial for our experiments because again, if the sample warms up, then our carefully trapped samples are ruined. Um, another big advantage of performing DNP at 25 Kelvin is that our signals are very large. So the Boltzmann polarization uh, 
which is just the thermal polarization of the nuclear spins at 25 Kelvin is about 12 times larger than at room temperature and about four times larger than at 100 Kelvin. And the microwave enhancement that we get, which is just the signal with microwaves on divided by the signal with microwaves off, um, is relative to this 25K Boltzmann polarization. Um, so the enhancements that we typically measure, which are around 60 to 100 on frozen labeled peptides, are relative to this quite large native Boltzmann polarization already. So our signals are very big. Uh, our signals are very large, and they let us perform um, experiments relatively quickly, which is always important when you're using the figure. Um, so next, I'm going to talk about the different techniques we use to trigger conformational changes in our experiments, um, and also talk about the different ways that we freeze our samples to acquire these snapshots. Um, these of, of, of the evolution process. But maybe I'll stop here if there are any questions uh, in the in the Q&A. Uh, thanks for that, Blake. I think actually we do have uh, one question, uh, or actually two. So an anonymous attendee wants to find out, uh, how do you ensure the sample is kept cold when packing the frozen samples in the ro rotor? That's a great question. Um, so the 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 there's a few there are a few ways that we can ensure that the 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 samples are kept cold the whole time. Um, the main way uh, the main way we can tell that our samples remain cold is actually by looking at the DNP. Um, so the uh, the DNP signal that we see, and in particular the DNP buildup time that we observe, um, it depends a lot on how the, the radical, our, our understanding is of it is that it depends a lot on how the radical uh, concentrates itself inside the frozen solution. If the, if the uh, rotor warms up during the transfer process um, enough that the frozen solution starts to undergo, uh, moves above its flash transition temperature and, and, and starts to undergo rearrangements. Um, typically, what we see right away is that our DMP buildup times get dramatically shorter. Um, and all, often that's also coupled with the enhancement that we see changing. Um, so we know about what DMP buildup time we should expect based on uh, measurements of fast frozen samples and measurements on, on samples of different radical concentrations. Um, and if the DNP buildup time is, is, is radically different from what we expect, uh, or if it changes from day to day on the same sample, if we measure the same sample more than once, then we can be, we can be quite confident that the sample has heated up uh, during the transfer process or at some point. Um, if, if that's not the case, if the, if the, um, if the, if the DMV buildup time is more along the lines of what we expect uh, at, at a given concentration and freezing speed, then we can be reasonably confident that we haven't warmed up enough to, to pass the sample through, through a, a glass transition temperature, which is a, typically for uh, glycerol water mixtures, which is what we use. We use glycerol as a cryoprotectant in our samples. Typically for glycerol water mixtures, that glass transition temperature is below the temperature where we would expect uh, any protein conformational changes to be taking place. So that's a, that's sort of that's sort of a sort of a, a, a safe point to say that that we haven't heated up the the a safe way to tell that we haven't heated the system the the, the sample up. It does happen certainly um, if you're not if you're not quick enough when you're making the the change. The sample change, or you know, if you if you drop the sample or something, uh, it can happen um, that the sample that, that you that you use the sample that way. Thanks a lot, Blake. Uh, we also have a good question uh, from Faith Scott, which says that uh, you swap samples quickly, and I'm assuming the probe is still cold while I put the sample in. How do you keep condensation from accumulating in the probe? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, especially in the summer in the Washington DC area where it gets pretty humid. Um, so the, the, there are a few, a few things that we do to try to eliminate 
compensation from getting into the probe. Uh, of course, one thing is that we try to do everything quickly. Um, so, you know, the long, the shorter the probe is out of, is, is below the magnet, and the shorter that the window on the side of the probe is open, the less time there is for condensation to get in. Um, but the thing that makes the big difference, or the, the, the biggest factor in minimizing condensation is that we're constantly purging the inside of the probe with nitrogen gas. So we have nitrogen gas purge lines that are purging out nitrogen gas right next to the window, basically, that we open to change our samples, um, and also purging nitrogen gas below, uh, below where we load the sample. Um, and that's, that's uh, both to keep, that, that, that helps keep moisture out, um, and it stops condensation forming as long as you don't open that window for too long. Um, and the, the other factor is that it's really a small region of the probe that gets cold. Um, the, cold the, the, the part of the probe that gets the coldest is really just the NMR stator itself. There, is, there are quite large temperature gradients uh, within the, the probe head itself. The metal, uh, there's a the metal kind of casing on the, on the outside of the probe is shown here, um, which gets uh, cold enough that you over, over a time scale of many minutes can start to see condensation forming on the outside of it, uh, but not so cold that you see condensation right away. So the key is moving quickly um, and having robust nitrogen purging um, on the inside of the probe to, to keep it dry and to keep moisture out. So does that, hope that answers the question. Yeah, thanks a lot, Blake. So uh, we have uh, another uh, question by uh, Mark Conradi, which says, uh, they really let you freeze quench into gasoline, even cold. <laughs> So I've never done that. <laughs> uh, that that those but but those but uh, yeah. My, I mean, my understanding for 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 using using things like cold propane, uh, the motivation there was was just to get as cold a melting point as uh, in, a, in a in a as cold a melting point as you could in a in a hydrocarbon. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, other, 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 if you're asking about other solutions, like other hydrocarbon solutions, like isopentane, um, you know, there, there the, the trick is, you know, not to, to, to be careful with it. We do everything in a FEMA hood um, and, and, you know, and, and taking safety precautions. Okay, thanks a lot, Blake. I think uh, that's all the questions we have for now. Great. All right. So uh, I'll talk now about some of the different techniques that we're using to trigger conformational changes in our experiments um, and in the ways that we use to freeze our samples to take these uh, snapshots of the folding, folding process. Um, a lot of the work uh, was carried out by my colleague, uh, Jake, Dr. Jaekyun Jian, um, who's been really pushing forward the work in, in the Tico lab um, in the last few years. And he's developed a number of techniques um, using time-resolved NMR uh, to measure shorter and shorter biophysical processes with more accuracy. And one of the things that he did was he built this rapid mixing device, um, which can rapidly combine two solutions uh, and then mix them in just 1.5 milliseconds and then produce a jet that can shoot out of the bottom of the mixer. Um, and the mixer is based on uh, a short section of tube filled with beads to create a turbulent flow. And that, that turbulent flow is key to achieving this fast mixing time. So rapid mixing can be used to drive conformational change by a bunch of different mechanisms, including rapid pH jump, or rapidly mixing a protein in a substrate, or rapidly mixing two different proteins, or changing the salt concentration, uh, or adding a denaturant, various different ways. Um, and then this uh, rapid freezing device, or sorry, this rapid mixing device, uh, uh, Jaekyun and Kent incorporated into a rapid freezing apparatus 
um, which uses a rotating copper plate. So in, in this apparatus, rather than using a cold hydrocarbon, um, the uh, a cold copper plate is pre-cooled in liquid nitrogen. Um, and then uh, a solution is sprayed out of this mixer uh, in, in the form of a jet. And then the jet is swept across the surface of this cold copper plate. Um, and as the jet hits the surface, this very fine jet, it freezes very quickly, uh, trapping whatever post-mixing uh, species you have um, for further study. And uh, Jae Kyun used this device to carry out a number of um, experiments. He's studied in particular uh, the pH jump induced folding of uh, this peptide melatin, which is a 26 residue peptide found in bee venom. Um, at low pH, melatin forms a cloud of disordered monomers. Um, as, as shown in this, in this uh, CD spectrum here. Um, but then at neutral pH, melatonin will form these alpha helical well-ordered oligomers, sorry, uh, in particular tetramers. Um, so Jae Kim carried out a series of very careful experiments um, where he rapidly mixed solutions of melatonin at pH 3, which were disordered, um, with a basic solution to raise the pH up to pH 7 in less than 1.5 milliseconds. Um, and then he varied the distance uh, that, that the jet produced by his mixer traveled after mixing in order to track this uh, folding process from uh, low pH unfolded state to neutral pH folded state. Um, and these NMR spectra here uh, show snapshots of the evolution process from unfolded monomers here at pH 3 to alpha helical to an alpha helical configuration at pH 7. Uh, which can be tracked by looking at the positions of these alpha carbon chemical shifts and also by the overall line narrowing that's observed uh, as a function of evolution time. Um, and then with the massive uh, signal enhancement afforded from DNP, uh, Jae Kim was able to acquire 2D spectra. These are 2D carbon-carbon correlation spectra uh, on the same uh, frozen samples in a number of hours as opposed to days. Uh, and this is despite the peptide concentration being just uh, a few hundred micromolar. Um, and then uh, Jae Kyun used these experiments, these rapid pH jump experiments, to um, probe what intermediates form in this folding process. So in particular, the question he asked uh, was, how does the transition uh, from, I should say, rapid pH jump uh, proceed. Uh, does, the, uh, does the protein first form alpha helices and then the alpha helices come together to form oligomers or do alpha helices and oligomerization occur concurrently? Um, and he answered this question uh, by looking at the buildup of cross peaks, long range cross peaks between, um, in, between nearby residues in the folded structure. Um, so by looking at the buildup between the, these two, this, this cross peak one right here, which is between this glycine and this leucine on the end terminus of, of one of these alpha helical regions, uh, Jae Kyun could probe the buildup of the alpha helical content of the, of the protein solution. So he could track the formation of alpha helices. Um, and then you could also track the formation of oligomers by looking at the, this cross peak marked in three, uh, which is a long range cross peak between uh, the leucine uh, residue on the N terminus of one um, monomer with the isoleucine on the C terminus of a neighboring monomer. Um, so plotted here are the cross peak ratios. In red is the uh, cross peak between uh, two different monomers, which is reporting on oligomerization. And in blue is the cross peak uh, within one monomer between two residues, uh, which is reporting on the, on the formation of alpha helices. And as you can see, these two processes occur on the same time scale, uh, which suggests a picture where 
the dimerization or oligomerization process is the rate limiting process because um, alpha helices and, and other uh, secondary structure elements uh, of, of short peptides like mel melatonin can form very quickly. They can form on a much faster time scale um, than, the, than the millisecond time scale. Um, so this suggests a picture where the alpha helical conformation of these monomers is stabilized by intermolecular contrast intermolecular contacts that are formed uh, in the center of this kind of hydrophobic core uh, in the middle of one of these melatonin tetramers. Um, so another technique we're developing to trigger biovisible processes uh, is rapid cooling. So many proteins, including melatonin, but also many others, unfold when they're heated. Um, and melatonin folding uh, and oligomerization turns out is highly sensitive to temperature as well as to concentration. Um, so at neutral pH, if you heat melatonin up to 90 C, it becomes largely unfolded. Not completely unfolded, but largely unfolded. Um, and when it's uh, at 30 C, it's largely folded. Um, so we've carried out experiments where we rapidly, where we first heat up uh, a solution of melatonin to 90 C and then rapidly cool the sample down to a temperature where uh, melatonin pre prefers to be in an alpha helical tetrameric configuration to track how thermal folding and unfolding proceeds. So uh, I, hope, I hope that you all enjoyed hearing about um, how we're carrying out time-resolved NMR these days uh, and also learn something about how this technique can be used. Um, we're, 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 we're really excited about this technique and we think that it can be applied to study many different systems, um, especially utilizing DNP, uh, which is really, really crucial. Uh, the signal enhancements that we get from DNP um, to, to applying this technique to a range of projects. So um, systems we, we certainly imagine applying uh, time-resolved NMR to are the folding of glob globular proteins, um, substrate binding and release, uh, we, can, we can imagine looking at an oligomerization of peptides and also looking at um, liquid liquid phase separation. For further publications, I encourage you to read uh, some of Jay Kuhn's more recent papers. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, all of my lab mates who, who have been working on this project, in particular, Rob, Jay Kuhn, uh, Kent, and Ming. We've all done, done a lot of work on this project as well as myself. So um, I, it looks like we still have time. We have plenty of time for questions. So uh, I, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thanks a lot for the awesome talk, Blake. So we have a couple of questions right now. One of them is from uh, Samuel Cousin, which asks, uh, with the HPLC, did you measure the pressure of the solution, in particular in presence of the nozzle? And uh, what is the impact of the pressure on the protein folding? That is an excellent question. Uh, the short answer is I have not measured that, uh, but certainly the pressure, uh, the pressure in the solution is changing dramatically as it, as it flows through a nozzle, um, in particular as it flows out of the tightly constricted nozzle and, and into free space in the form of a jet. Uh, so certainly um, pressure jumps and large pressure changes can have an impact on protein folding. Um, proteins uh, that protein there there are many proteins where you uh, at high pressure will uh, either form different folded states uh, or or might unfold actually if their folded state occupies a larger volume than their unfolded state. So uh, the, the 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 pressure jumps that that we see are relatively relatively modest at least compared to compared to purpose-built pressure jump experiments um, of which a lot of a lot of work uh, has, has been done uh, on uh, but the the short answer is that we're not we're not we're not too we're not too take too much taking into account the pressure difference right now okay awesome uh I think uh, Jay Kuhn has uh, added a comment. The pressure range is a uh, thousand psi, from a uh, five hundred to one thousand five hundred psi, more precisely. 
Uh, we also have another question from an anonymous attendee, which asks, uh, what are your DNP conditions, uh, radicals and glass forming agents you're using? Uh, first, yeah, thank you, Jake Hune, for pointing that out. Um, I was, I was thinking, I was thinking more specifically what was happening at the nozzle. But you're absolutely right that the pressures used, uh, the pressures used generated by the pumps are are in the range that that Jake Hune indicated. So, uh, around a thousand psi. Uh, in terms of the radicals and glass forming agents, uh, the glass forming agents that we typically, the glass forming agent that we typically use is glycerol. Um, and we typically use relatively, uh, relatively modest, I guess you could say, uh, glycerol concentrations compared to compared to what we would use if we're if we're slowly freezing samples. So we use around twenty percent glycerol. Uh, the, the the data that I that I showed here, um, the the DNP data was using a twenty percent glycerol solution, um, which if you're freezing rapidly, uh, is enough to form a good glass. But that is dependent definitely on your freezing rate. The slower you freeze, the more glycerol, um, the more glycerol content is needed to form a good glass. And 20% glycerol is, 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 is not enough to form a good glass if you're freezing by, for example, just dunking the rotor uh, directly in, into liquid nitrogen. You really need to be freezing very quickly. Um, and then in terms of radicals, uh, we, I, I believe the data that I showed today were all using um, amupole as the, as the polarizing, polarizing agent. But uh, these days we are typically not using amupole, but rather we're using uh, triradicals, um, dotopa derivatives in particular. So they're, they're nitroxide-based triradicals um, that uh, have very favorable properties, especially at low temperatures, so at 25 Kelvin. Um, they have, uh, they, they, they offer uh, faster DNP buildup times um, and uh, large absolute signals. Okay, thanks a lot for that, Blake. Uh, we also have another question from uh, Eric Huon, which asks, uh, is the DNP enhancement quantitative uh, folded versus unfolded states when you measure the time evolution of conformation? Uh, is the DNP enhancement quantitative folded versus unfolded state? Um, that is a good question. Uh, so that depends on a number of factors. It depends on the size of the, it depends on the size of the protein. So if you're asking, is the enhancement going to be the same for a folded protein versus an unfolded protein? Uh, I think the answer there is going to depend on the size of the protein. Um, uh, but in general, for the for for relatively small proteins, um, we don't we, we we don't see a change. We believe we believe that DN, the DNP. You see how to answer this. So, quantitative. Uh, we believe that the signal is quantitative, um, at least in the sense that we can compare relative relative intensities within a single within within a single spectrum. So if we have a if we have a, a sample that contains folded and unfolded proteins, and we both are enhanced by DNP, and the question is, do we think that the enhancement is the same between those two species? And 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 so therefore, can we trust uh, the size of the signals that we see? As reporting on at least the relative um, populations in those two states, and the answer there is yes. We we, we do believe uh, at least for for the small proteins that we're studying, um, the the DNP enhancement is at least in a relative way like that quantitative. Um, in terms of sample sample to sample uh, variations in the DNP enhancement uh, are sort of preclude you from being quantitative sample to sample. So you can't, you, you, you certainly couldn't, uh, you, if you wanted to really be quantitative about the concentration, you, you certainly couldn't compare the absolute signals between two different samples. Um, but within the same sample, um, we generally can be quantitative. 